today we wanted to talk how we integrated uh, observability into Argo CD and Argo rollouts, uh, which is backed by AI ops, and how that's helping into it reduce MTTD and MTTR. My name is Amit Kalamkar. I lead observability and analytics at Intuit. I have with me Vijit Morris. He is a principal engineer for the, that tech, tech track. Here's the agenda for today. We will talk about a specific problem that is change-induced incident and how we resolved it using AI ops. We have a demo both for Argo CD and Argo rollouts. And then we'll talk about Numa Proj, which is our open source AI ops project and how that's powering all this. And if time permitting, we will do some questions. Most of you should know Intuit from our flagship products, QuickBooks, TurboTax, uh, Credit Karma. All these products are powered by these five platform areas internally. These platform areas ensure that we provide value to customers as well as we accelerate innovation. Me and Vijit belongs to developer experiences and platforms. Our group is responsible for all build time and runtime uh, at Intuit. Just to give you an idea about scale, we run around 2,000 plus services on Kubernetes. And the investment we have done on modernization of the internal platforms have resulted in 6x improvement in development velocity at Intuit. Intuit is very much bought into open source. Uh, we not only use it, but we have uh, active contributors and maintainers for a lot of CNCF projects, including Argo, Istio, and others. We are also one of the largest end user company. And with the new capability we are open sourcing, like Numa Proj, we are continuing the collaboration with other end user companies. Let me first start with giving you guys an idea of our tech ecosystem at Intuit. We started the modernization of this platform in 2018. We pretty much modernized everything, front-end platforms, back-end platforms. We moved all our container payloads as part of this to Kubernetes. We also created payout roads, both for serverless and services, that gave our developers end-to-end -end automation from commit to deploy. As part of this automation, we made a deliberate effort to instrument all layers of our platform infrastructure and applications out of box. So we get real-time events from all over the place, and we store it in the operational data lake. This data we use to derive actionable insight for different areas, like operational excellence, cost, security, and so forth. To derive this actionable insight at scale, we needed a platform, AI apps platform, that can scale. And that's how Numa Proj was born. Numa Proj is a Kubernetes native data processing and analytics tools. It consists of two areas. One is Numa Flow, which deals with data processing. It makes data processing easy, scalable, and reliable. And Numa Logic, which we have open sourcing a lot of models which we use internally and which runs on Numa Flow. You will learn more about this project as we go through the presentation. One of the core principles at Intuit is innovation. We want to make sure we innovate, and we innovate fast. We do over 1,000 releases per day in production. And that's only possible because the investment we made in Argo. Most of the people might know Argo. Intuit created Argo and open sourced it. Over 100 companies now use it across the world. Being one of the largest SaaS company, one of operational excellence is always at the forefront for Intuit. We want to make sure that our products are always available. And if there are issues, we resolve them fast, so there is less MTTD and MTTR for, for our incidents. So we are always looking at ways to improve this. One of the areas we saw where it needed improvement is change-related incidents. We found out that one-third of our incidents were caused by change, and their MTTD was higher. And then we dig into a little bit more into the data as why it's happening. There were few reasons. Our deployment as well as operational experiences were disjoint. So people were deploying, but they needed to go different dashboard to figure out what's happening. Two, people had to go to hundreds of metrics and needs to be really know the application very well to understand the quality of the change. 
and it depends on, on the developer how much, how much they know the uh, application to resolve. Three, we didn't have an automatic AI ops based rollback through Argo rollouts, and that resulted in a higher MTTT. So what we did, the solution was we brought our AI ops based observability into Argo CD and rollouts. We did three things. One, we added a metrics tab to Argo CD. So as soon as you deploy, you can check whatever metrics are relevant to application, then they are itself. Two, instead of going through hundreds of metrics and making a manual judgment, we run a multivariant model, which is powered by our Numa Proj, where you get one signal which tells the quality of your change, whether it's good or bad. Three, we removed the human from the equation. We integrated with Argo rollouts so that if the change is bad, it automatically rolls back. And that has helped us reduce MTTD and MTTR. So let me hand it over to Vijay to show a demo. Thank you, Amit. Um, so let me start off with the demo where, like, let's, this is the person is a service developer. So let's pretend I'm a service developer and I'm going to make a change. The change I'm about to make has a small bug inside it, and we will use the three features Amit talked about. That's the metrics uh, we have integrated, the time series anomaly scores we have, and also the automated rollback that auto uh, rolls back and mitigate the problem. For that, first let me introduce a demo app. Okay, so what it what you see here is that um, the, the, when the browser renders, it, it talks to the backend, and backend gives you two things. One is the type of the fish. Here you see octopus. This is the version one we are running. And the color of the fish, yellow represents a happy state. That meaning we are getting successful requests from the backend. Once in a while, you will see a red unhappy octopus going around. This shows that the backend has an unhealthy response. The key thing to note here is it's okay to have one of few errors as long as it does not violate your SLA or SLO. Now the change I'm going to make is a change in the backend. And the way we make that change is, uh, let's go to the pull request. I'm going to merge this PR in. Do a refresh. And synchronize the change. So this is an Argo rollout change, meaning this is a progressive delivery where a new canary gets deployed as part of the change I just deployed. right? And you will see that the new, uh, the old ports are getting terminated and the new, new ports are coming up. In the same time, what happens is that, so if you see, right, uh, visually you can see on the uh, right-hand side, right, there is a new set of slow-moving red, uh, one could say evil fishes moving around, right? This is the new version of the application. It is slow and you see that it's erroring out, right? The point is that, um, uh, in real life, unlike the demo, you don't go to, let's say, I, I don't deploy and go to TurboTax online to see whether there's a redfish, right? The, the meaning, uh, these are very subtle errors, right? And the way you detect these kind of errors are looking at the metrics your application collects. This, but this demo is just to show the effect of such a bad change manifested in the UI, right? So what you need is you want to look at the metrics and quantify whether it releases good or bad. Along the lines, you need to know that we do see in Argo CD, right, you see that it's healthy. The resources are shown as healthy, though the application behind it is unhealthy. Here the health means your resources is healthy, but it does not represent the state of your application. Now, traditionally, one would uh, go to your metrics provider to look at logs. So this is the problem, statement number one, where we said, hey, we have metrics in integrated with Argo CD. Right now, when you open, what you see here is the default template uh, it's written golden signals as the tab name. It's, it's just a default configuration. We have deployed it into it. It's just a collection of metrics which, which we think are vital for our application. It's from the family of metrics called request errors duration and also utilization saturation and errors. This is out of the box for any application at Intuit. You can reconfigure it to whatever you think is the right thing. It's totally GitOps driven, the, uh, the tab itself. And the way you read this metrics is the good old way. The x-axis is per minute. That's how we have configured it. And uh, the way to interpret the metric is the latency is second, actually, on the left axis. So the current stable hash, that is 5B7, the blue line, is having around 0 0.04 millisecond latency, while the new canary hash is around having 0.8 second latency. That's what you clearly see with the new canary versus the old octopus release, right? Um, I told average, it doesn't mean you have to see average. It's also, the even metric is config driven. You can 
point it to percentiles or whatever you see is right. I'll talk about how we get the metrics down the lane. We also have other metrics like status code, that is total number of requests with 200, with canary, and so if you see here, right, we do see some successful yellow happy fishes too. It's just that the number of requests successful are very low. So along the same line, we have error, right? You can clearly see there's a spike in error. We have HTTP traffic, and just to show that this charting library is very powerful, we added a pie chart out there. Yeah, it doesn't mean much, but just to show that the power of the charting library, right? And we also have utilization metrics uh, per port per deployment. One by looking at here could say that, hey, my deployment is unhealthy, right? My errors are higher. I do see higher latencies and can come to that conclusion. But what we found out is in real life, you have way more metrics than that. And you should be a very experienced application developer in that platform to really understand whether you can qualify or quantify whether a deployment is good or bad. So you need to analyze a lot of metrics holistically. What we wanted was we wanted one single score that can define it for you, right? That is the AIOS part of it. So this is a multivariant AIOps platform that looks into multiple metrics, which is again configurable. You can uh, configure as many metrics to look into and gives you one single score to make the decision, right? The way you have to interpret the score is if the score is between zero to three, it is uh, operating within the normal operating pattern. Between three to seven, it is de deviating and beyond seven, it is totally deviant. Um, and uh, if you see on the right hand side, the, roll, the rollback has happened automatically. I'll talk to, I'll get to that how it happened. But the key thing is while I'm explaining, things have happened. We have mitigated the problem. This anomaly, unlike the demo where we show the yellow fishes and the red fishes, this is a real thingy. We have been using it into it for the last four years. We use this to create incidents when there is a spike in user behaviors, right? Anomalous behaviors they are saying in front end, when we see anomalous behaviors when services talk to each other. So this is a real thingy. And that's the reason we open sourced it, because we felt that the community could use it. And we, that is the new myologic part of it, where we open source this model so you could use it. Lastly, let me get into the, how did the rollback happen. So we have an analysis template. I think I might have to increase the font here a little bit. So the, what we do is, like, if you were to see here, right, um, I hope you can see this. Yeah. Right? Now, this is an anomaly which just looks into your canary deployment. Unlike the entire deployment, just, just focus on the canary delta small deployment you have made. And the success criteria for this deployment is that the anomaly should be less than three. So the moment it sees that it is more than three, it goes and auto rollbacks, right? So this is an A-B testing between your stable hash and the canary hash. That's the power of this. So you can do anomaly at different levels. We have, at, in the AOPS level, you are looking at the application as a whole. Here we are looking at the canary as it is. And you can see that it failed because the score is coming very, very close to 10, right? Of course, greater than three is a failure, but you can clearly see the number of errors were high and that hence we rolled back. I think this is the demo we have. And so you saw three things. One is the metrics. I just wanted to finish it off just showing that, right? So one is the metric you saw. That is the, if you see here, right? So if you see even the metric, after the deployment has gotten over, your values are smaller, right? The new canary is no longer seen in the metrics. Then you saw the AOPS that looks into the entire system as a whole. And lastly, you saw the canary deployment, the canary analysis using AOPS. So the three things we saw. Now let me get into the architecture on how we are doing it and continue. Okay, so uh, how are we seeing it, right? So when user loads the Argo CD UI, it talks to Argo CD server. Here we use Argo CD extension framework to see whether observability has been turned on. We developed a new thing called Argo CD metric server, which is for this project, which can pull metrics from any service provider. We have Prometheus, at Intuit we use Prometheus, hence Prometheus, but it can talk to any service provider. This is a decoupled architecture. Now, this is the first metrics you saw, right? The metrics that is being collected by Prometheus. Since this is a decoupled architecture, to see the anomaly score, all you need to do is the NUMA project just need to write anomaly back to the Prometheus. That's the way you saw the AIOps tab. This is how it is feeding it off. Now, to do Argo rollouts, all you need to do is do the analysis template from Prometheus. So NUMA project will write another anomaly score just for the canary deployment so that you can get the score in, um, again, for analysis template by Argo rollouts, and that makes the decision of rolling back. Now, this brings into the second question, how do we do anomaly? This anomaly is computed even though you are not looking, rendering the UI or not even when you are just um, deploying. It's always on. This is a streaming system which always inspects and says whether your system is doing well. 
The way it happens is, the Prometheus has a feature called remote writer. So it, for every metric it scrapes, it will push the metric real time streams into our NUMA project, NUMA flow on which the NUMA logic runs, and uh, it does feature engineering, like scaling the metric and so forth. Once it um, does that, it does the inferencing, right? It assigns an anomaly score. Once the anomaly score has been uh, computed, we do post-processing. This is to normalize it to a human understandable format and give it between zero to 10. Otherwise, it will be too complex for them to interpret it. And this is an N plus one anomaly score. So we compute for each multivariant aspect, one anomaly score and one plus one to have the unified anomaly score. Since it is an operation system, things change all the time. We cannot always configure the anomaly system. It auto discovers about new applications that come online, new configurations that come online. That means we have to do an inline training all the time. So we trigger a training, training fetches the data from Prometheus and it stores it in model storage. Model storage, out of the box, we do ML flow and training is ARG overflows. But this is how the streaming system was and this has been the streaming system at, conceptual streaming system at Intuit for last four years. Since we have been streaming, doing streaming for a while, we ran into a couple of challenges to do real-time streaming. The problem number one is a um, lot of boilerplate code for streaming. What it means is, what we found out was our ML engineers are spending more time writing streaming code and doing the infrastructure for streaming. Like, for example, if you use Kafka, creating Kafka topics, uh, how to reliably read, consume, produce data, and so forth, rather than what they do the best, that is ML exploration and ML experiments. So that was one bigger problem for us. Second was ad hoc code. Here, ad hoc actually means um, non-standard. For example, we deploy streaming systems as a deployment, which is mostly good for north-south traffic, while streaming systems are east-west. So there's much more to that, meaning you need to really understand how the pipe is. It's basically fluid dynamics at that point. Streaming systems are more like fluid dynamics. Right? It's not a north-south, one single transaction. It has much more to that. Context is very important. This all brought in a problem where it's very difficult to do quick experimentation and extension. For example, we want to play a new model. We want to try different kind of feature engineering. And we want to extend some more enrichment, right? This, this made it very difficult for us to do it. This does not mean that there are no other data streaming systems out there. There are excellent systems like Apache Flink, Spark Streaming, SAMHSA, to name few. But those are very complex data engineering tools, meant to do data engineering in a data centralized way. In this demo, what is in the earlier demo, what in the NUMA project, the whole system pipeline sits along with your application namespace. It's so lightweight that it sits along with your application namespace and computes anomaly. You don't need to do that. Like, so we moved all the problems to the data producer side. So we needed a very lightweight, cost efficient and a lightweight system rather than complex systems like data engineering tools and frameworks we have. So for these reasons, um, we did experiments and then we ended up building our own system. This is the NUMA flow. NUMA flow is uh, distributed, uh, meaning it can scale to very ex extent, uh, big levels. And um, distributed DAG-based, director acyclic graph-based uh, stream processing system, which is native to Kubernetes, designed with the concept that data engineering and stream processing, right, mainly stream processing, should be very easy for both application and ML engineers. The way it works is, you listen to a stream, it's an unbounded stream, the data keeps coming, it never ends, right? And it reads the data, then it uh, tracks event time and watermarks. These are some advanced features for completeness. Then it passes to the first user-defined function. All it cares is, I've, you are given a key and a value, the output can be zero, one, or many key and values. So the moment the output has been computed, it can choose which path it has to take. Either it can take all the path or a subset of path. This is for A-B testing, weighted experiments, and whatnot. That is called conditional forwarding internally. Right? So we do that, and then we, you can have as many UDFs as you want. In the end, we have a sync. Sync is, uh, its main job is to make sure that we persistently write the data to a stream or to a blob stop. You can easily write a user-defined sync because there are, like, you, you might come up with many different ways to write it, and we define very easy way to write UDFs and syncs. So what are the features of NumaFlow? The most important, I would say, the value is the, uh, the one thing which we hold true to very core to ourselves is it should be very, very easy to use. You should be able to get it up and running in five minutes, and it should be, even we would say, you should be able to learn it in less than five minutes. It's language agnostic, meaning you can write in any different language you like, each UDFs and uh, things. It is lightweight, it's native to Kubernetes, you should be able to run it on edge. 
cost efficient. It can auto scale to zero. Meaning if you don't have, see any traffic, it can reduce itself to zero. So there is no cost incurred whatsoever. It can resume from where it left off. With this complex systems, what we need is separation of concerns. Streaming systems are very complex. It can get very, very, with a bigger DAG, right? So separation of concerns is very important and we separate functions as units and each functions we guarantee that the data transfer between them is exactly one semantic so there is no duplication problems or so it means we also support other lower demands but uh, semantics like at least ones but the key thing is we support exactly one semantics with all this we have these uh, these we have standardized streaming what it means is if you were to change in the demo you saw we saw writing from prometheus and we were writing back to prometheus for uh, writing the anomaly score you can easily replace both the source with kafka and the sync with something else but the core logic of ml system still works this is how we use the same platform for um, customer centric um, anomaly detection and whatnot, meaning the core anomaly detection all you need to do is change the source and the sync right uh, things will work and we also do back pressure handling. That means uh, we can understand the resistance among the data flow and then auto scale. This is where your consumer is slower than your producer. So we auto scale based on back pressure. And then we have watermarks for correctness. Lastly, anything that is built on Numa flow should be operationally excellent. It's a fire and forget model because your input never ends. It's a unbounded stream. So you turn it on and then you can forget about it because we take care of automated retries, pod migration, node migration, and whatnot. Now let me quickly in introduce NumaLogic. NumaLogic actually is the ML system we have and is, is powering the real-time analytics. This is it's a library actually, but it works very well when run on top of Numa flow. The way we use it today is that we have a stream coming in, we do pre-processing, we do inference post-processing and write it to a sync. And we have uh, many different models. For example, we have auto encoders, clustering logics, and so forth for different use cases. But on a very, very high level, this is how the deployment looks like in and around. Okay? And we also do inline training using the same system. So you infer, you find that the model has become stale or you need a different way to train it. You can pass in the information we train. The sync here is the ML flow sync. So it can be feed, there's a feedback loop back to inference system. The features it provides is, Numa logic is a model repository for AIOps models, which is very, very well written for time series data. Uh, there is a lot of data processing uh, toolkits available with it, which helps you do analyze, understand operational data, which is time series in nature. Online training is out of the box. A bit experimentation is one core feature. We really, really hold, um, uh, hold on to it because we experiment a lot with ML models. And the point of this is, earlier we had a lot of problem with ML developers having tough time with streaming and everything. This improves ML development velocity. It's a cookie cutter development, right? You write your UDFs, you deploy it, you get every feature of Numa logic, which I talked about, and much more than what Numa logic provides on top of it. With this, actually, um, yeah, the, the earlier slide didn't do justice to Numa flow or Numa logic because it's a very complex system. Come to our board, talk about, we can talk more about it. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'll give it to Amit to talk about the roadhead. So thank you, Vijay, for awesome demo and introduction to Numa Proj. So what's next for us? Uh, we are obviously adopting it across our Argo CD and Argo rollout clusters. We have also very rich uh, roadmap for Numa Proj. Uh, on Numa Flow side, some of the things which we are open sourcing includes windowing and aggregations, which we use internally. On Numa Logic side, we will be open sourcing other models which we use internally, like forecasting. These are our gates. Uh, so if you go to the, any of these gates, there are a lot of examples and documentation how to get started. Uh, you can take a look at it. If you like it, you can start it. Uh, you can also, uh, like Vijit said, uh, go to our booth. There are other use cases for Numa Proj you can look at, including streaming workflows, image processing, automatic scale up and scale down. Uh, so it means you can visit that and we can have a discussion. Lastly, before I end, I also wanted to thank Nats. Uh, we have been collaborating with them on Numa Proj for Jetstream. Uh, so thank you and we are open for questions.